Shut it, man! All right, the squad. If you've been living under a rock or you've been hit of a brick, we've finally reached it to Graceland. Couple of quick updates before we start. First update on the boy Barood. We have applied for an entry to the UK visa, but it's taken its sweet ass time and there's nothing I can do about this, all right? It's not canceled, I've not pocketed the money, so if you say I have, it's not funny. Furthermore, I'm actually shocked some of you still don't even know what Rinka King is. Stop watching this video and go watch my main video I made about it. It's much better than anything else I've done. Second update, I interviewed Athena the other day, which is now on the Patreon. This is Athena the TNA girl for anyone who's confused. Link's in the description if you want to check that out. In your only other TNA match, you took uh, David Young's Cab Driver Slam, the the big spine buster. Uh, most devastating move in wrestling, if you didn't know. I, I, I mean, I, I believe that. But I always loved working with David. He was a great guy to work with and, and super talented guy. So, And he did the Cab Driver Slam, which everyone loves on my channel. So that's, <laughs> I didn't realize that's what it was called. Uh, I, 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 saw a I remember Spine Buster, so I didn't realize. Was it, is that his name for it? Yeah. Or is yeah. it your name for it? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know why. No, okay. Don't ask me. All right. Well, we need to ask him. I'll send him a message later. <laughs> Be like, I should do that. Right yeah. now. Definitely do that. Third thing. I've seen one or two comments who think I've sold out by making some list videos of late. Don't worry. These will always just be extras to my normal schedule. I know some of you are sick of lists. And Ring of the Hawk 3 is officially started, which I'm buzzing for. I'm not really buzzing after sitting for that Wes Briscoe video, but things can only improve from here. We've got to have a positive outlook going forward. So before we do go forward to season 3, we need to do another episode of Was It Any Good? Because today's video is one that I'm really unsure of, so the Hawk needs to find out, there's no need to shout. AJ Styles No One Did It Make The Girls Run? This is the final part of his time in TNA when he went for a drastic character change, and I think this should be a good one. We need to watch it we should, it certainly could be misunderstood, or should it hide like a hood, was it any good? AJ Styles wasn't having a very good 2012. He'd just come through the worst storyline of his career, the Claire Lynch storyline, and he seemed further away from the world title than ever. At the November pay-per-view turning point, AJ lost a number one contendership match which also banned him from a title shot for almost an entire year. It had already been a long time since Styles had the title, so what on earth was he going to be doing for another year without main eventing? Despite just finishing a storyline with Daniels and Kazarian, he was shoved back in another one. Daniels requested one final match against Styles. It felt like this happened every year in TNA. AJ Styles would normally beat Daniels, but AJ was having a bad year and Daniels was confident. Styles said even on Daniels' best day and AJ's worst, he could still beat him. Then at final resolution, Daniels went and beat him, with his own move. This loss was correctly played up as a big deal, because as established, AJ would normally beat Daniels. Following that, Styles cut a promo saying that he'd spent too much time being a company man and always doing the right thing and not enough time focusing on himself. And just like that, he was taken off TV for two months, and this is the start the storyline we'll be looking at today. A TV crew eventually caught up with AJ's childhood friend, and his wife, but they weren't bumping feathers. They were just interviewed separately, alright, there's no need to chat guys. It sounded like AJ hadn't really been home, and they'd say that he'd been drinking and doing drugs, and he'd left his wife and kids. Jesus, this sounds interesting. Then just by coincidence, AJ happened to walk into the room mid-interview. He looks a dishevelled mess and refused to talk. He storms off and leaves on a motorbike. This is interesting, it's worth noting that Aces and Eights storyline is running parallel with this one and they're a bunch of bikers invading TNA. Except they all suck and AJ doesn't. The cameraman keeps bothering Styles over the next couple of weeks whilst it looks like he's meeting up with some of the biker crew members. I remember people trying to zoom in on this photo back in the day to see if the guy in the cut had Aces and Eights written on him. I don't think it was ever confirmed. AJ seemed like he was a heel for the first time in years. He soon reappeared back in TNA, running off his enemies, Daniels and Kazarian. But then something interesting. He also clotheslines the cowboy James Storm. Okay, I'm invested. Good. So that proved that he hated all wrestlers, good or bad. But his hair now looks a bit emo. It hadn't quite reached the soccer mum look that he's got now. So this was bad. He was now miserable and emotionless. He refused to speak to anyone. Taz the small orange crab who likes MMA couldn't even get a response from him. He tried to get AJ to join the Aces and Eights. He just wouldn't explain why he punched James Storm. AJ continued having problems with Storm. He watched on from the crowd as Storm was beaten to a pulp by the Aces and Eights. This wasn't helping the accusations that AJ was with the Aces and Eights. The Aces and Eights were buzzing around AJ like a fly on turd. With the Aces and Eights becoming more of a threat in TNA, Hogan also started courting AJ as he wanted him to leave Team TNA. It really sounded like that time during the Invasion storyline where Vince McMahon wanted Stone Cold Steve Austin to be the old Stone Cold. 
So now we have the Aces and Eights, Hogan, and amazingly, Daniels and Kazarian making a recruitment pitch to Styles. With everyone wanting to recruit Styles, the crowd chanted, Hogan. Yet again, AJ doesn't have any answers. It's been two months and we've barely learned a thing about where he's been. This is bad. Slow burn is fine, but you've got to feed us a bit of information. Hogan was none too happy at being ignored and he put Styles and Storm in a match as punishment. The first Styles match in four months? Well, that doesn't sound good. Let's find out what his in-ring style is going to be like. Because it looks like AJ's put on about 20 pounds. Doesn't look too bad on him. I don't mean it in a sort of he's getting fat way, but he just looks a bit more broad. And also, is anyone else getting like Sting vibes from the original NWO period? AJ's now wrestling a much more grounded style. In fact, it's almost boring to watch. He debuts a new move though, a submission, a calf killer that caused Storm to tap out. It's cool seeing AJ do something different, but they've taken away everything that made him popular in the first place. His moves, his character, his taunts, his charisma. He's just an emotionless wrestler. This is bad. It's like the Angelina Love zombie time-traveling lesbian gimmick again. We take note of everything on this series, and it's worth pointing out that the crowd are no longer reacting when AJ's music hits. I know I said it was like Sting, but the camera's barely focused on AJ's face, and he has that scruffy hair and angry screw face going on. He looks pretty stupid in that jacket too. I don't know, let me know down below. Do you think this was a good look for Styles? I won't judge him on this one. I know it's the impact zone and you can only read so much into their crowd reaction, but it does affect your viewing experience at home. AJ Styles now attacks Kurt Angle and it looks more and more likely that he's with the Aces and Eights. So AJ has a decision to make eventually, or at least it needs to be confirmed. At the end of May, Jesus, it's been like five months, AJ Styles finally makes a decision. It looks like he's joining the Aces and Eights after he shares a beer with Bully Ray and puts on a biker jacket. They all hug, they kiss, they grab each other's asses, and then he hits Kurt Angle with a hammer. Unfortunately for Bully Ray, as soon as they all turn around, AJ smashes some of them with a hammer too and then runs away. He's with no one. His second match was against the Aces and Eights, Mr. Anderson. I'm just not enjoying it, I'm sorry. Kurt Angle mercifully rushed AJ, causing a DQ finish. Bad, man, bad. At Slammiversary, AJ Styles debuted some new entrance music. It's slow. It's not a bad song at all, I actually quite like it, but it just doesn't seem to fit him. Emo Styles took on Kurt Angle in only his third match in five and a half months. Come on, there's nothing good about that. What I've noted from this match is props to Styles. He literally comes up with a whole new range of moves to go of his character. Angle wins this match now, so where the hell does AJ in this storyline go? Well, randomly, AJ gets his way into a competition called the Bound for Glory series. The winner gets a world title shot. Now I haven't spoken too much about this on this channel, but it's basically a point scoring tournament held over a long period with different points for different match types and it also ran at house shows. AJ cuts a weird dark promo whilst the audience sits in silence. He says he's now doing it for the money. AJ doesn't get off to a good start in this tournament as he couldn't even beat Samoa and Joe before the time limit expires and then he throws a tantrum because he couldn't win the match. Pretty dislikable. Then he goes and gets eliminated first in a battle royal. At this rate they're going to rename this the Bound to Shove It series. They've done a decent job getting over his new submission, the calf killer, I have to say. He gets 10 points in the tournament by making Jeff Hardy tap out, and another 10 tapping out Kazarian. He also picks up some points on house shows. Well, they probably didn't even actually happen. It was probably like Goldberg's streak and the amount of wins that got tacked onto that. The problem with this tournament is everyone's out there trying to have long, good matches, and then you've got the aces and eights at the same time destroying everyone. There's literally no time for anything else, and that includes AJ's new character. He needs promos and storylines to develop, but he's just a miserable looking wrestler. It seems the only time AJ gets a reaction out of the crowd is when he's used his old moves. He had maybe his last great singles match against Austin Aries. An intense brawl with reversals everywhere. Aries just about scrapes through and beats Styles. After 8 months, something finally happens. The main event Mafia were fighting the Aces and Eights, but found themselves a man down. AJ emerged during the main event to his slow music, but then it paused and it switched to his old music. He goes nuts and so does the crowd. And then AJ went on to win the match for his team by beating Devon with the Styles Clash. This loss kicked Devon out of TNA. AJ seems to have completely ditched the Lone Wolf character at this point and he's now trying to appeal to the fans as much as possible. AJ ends up finishing first in points for the tournament, but there was still a little case of needing to fight the final four for the final winner. And that he did, he just went through Austin Aries again with a top rope Styles Clash, and Magnus with the Spiral Tap, a move we haven't seen for a long time. So at least this wrestling's getting more interesting, that's good. So AJ went from being a loser who was banned from receiving a title shot for a year, to going into a position where he was going to challenge for the belt one year later. Seems so simple, so this storyline needed some spicing up. 
So after he was crowned the Bound for Glory series winner, he threatened Dixie Carter and said he was going to drop a bombshell on her and reveal all of her mistakes. Well, this is a very different AJ Styles. He's randomly doing shoot promos on Dixie. He laughs at her for only getting a wrestling company because her daddy got the money for it. He blames her for breaking up the TNA roster and getting rid of Jerry Lynn, Loki, Alex Shelley and Jay Lethal. He hates MMA guys and he hates ex-WWE guys and it pisses him off. AJ says Dixie is looking at her biggest mistake right now though because he's not got a TNA contract. An obese AJ Styles fanboy in the crowd goes mad. He looks like a South Park character. AJ wants to put Dixie on her knees and make her pay. That dumb bitch Dixie responds by telling AJ that she should never have let him think he was special and he's just a big fish in a small pond. Way to big up your own company, Dixie. She says the phenomenal AJ Styles is a marketing gimmick and she makes fun of him saying he doesn't have five star matches anymore. She wants him to be the marginal one from now on. Dixie Carter built TNA and AJ is lucky to even play in it. AJ tries to respond to Dixie as she desperately tries to get them to turn the cameras off. If she hates AJ so much and he's not even contracted, why doesn't she, you know, not let him have a title shot. I didn't see him sign a contract for one, so it would be possible, you idiot. Dumb. Hogan tries to get Styles to sign a new contract, but Dixie comes out and tears it up. By the middle of October, Dixie Carter's put a $50,000 bounty on his head in an effort to get rid of him for the Bound for Glory main event. I think she was a bit cheap though, because it didn't seem to motivate anyone enough to actually do it, just jobbers and scrubs and bad influence. In one instance, AJ escaped by spraying a fire extinguisher and bad influence were too blinded to find him. He's literally been in the ring twice and nobody's managed to claim the bounty. They actually do have a contract signing for the world title match now on the same night as the bounty was set. So I was right earlier. How many dumb things is Dixie going to be involved with? Why is she letting him sign a contract when she's just going to put a bounty on his head earlier in the night? Bully Ray's promo here is incredible and AJ's is short and he has to resort to calling Bully Ray a dumb bitch. AJ vows to win the world title so that he's in a position to be able to make Dixie Carter beg him. The bully overshadowed him on the mic quite a way. This is bad. Bully Ray then decides he wants to cash in on the bounty, but he's sent away by Stars with one briefcase shot. And then the show ends with AJ throwing $50,000 all over the ring. I do really like the match they have though. There's some pretty cool moments of Bound for Glory. Gotta love AJ missing the springboard 450 and crashing through a table on the outside. It's definitely not your normal AJ Styles match though. It feels like a long hardcore match. AJ should have it one with a springboard 450, but Dixie stops the count whilst Mike Tanay almost reaches the point of climax. AJ takes a back body drop on the exposed boards in the ring from where Bully tore it apart earlier. We also get an incredibly rare moment as Bully hits the second rope ass drop. Can't recall him ever even hitting that move. Props to AJ for taking that amount size on you. Good. AJ eventually wins it with the spiral tap and he's crowned the TNA Heavyweight Champion. Was this the last ever really happy moment in TNA history? I mean he goes into the crowd and it's treated quite happy. It's not treated like a massive deal, there's no confetti or anything. But at least he went to celebrate with the fans, the people who made him. Good. You know, that's something good that's come out of this no one period of his career. He got another title reign. With Styles now the champion, Dixie decided she was going to try and be nice to him and kiss his ass. Unfortunately, she takes credit for his turnaround in fortune, so it's not exactly a sincere apology and celebration. She offers Styles a cheap watch from Argos and a second hand convertible. He says he's a truck guy, despite being seen driving around on motorbikes lately. He's still got the little question of Bully Ray's world title rematch though, and AJ defends the title no problem, and now Dixie is truly screwed. As AJ considers signing the contract, the crowd chant, we want Hogan. AJ ends up wiping the contract on his ass. I guess that's a different way to do it rather than tearing it up. And he leaves in the car that Dixie gifted him. For the next couple of months, AJ Styles still appears on TNA in pre tape segments. Dixie was crowning a new champion, but AJ was refusing to send the title back and instead he took it to Japan and Mexico. He defended it against El Macias and AAA and Sonada and Wrestle 1. They do this episode where Rockstar Spud goes hunting for AJ Styles. It's pretty good. He breaks into Styles' house and tries to take the belt. AJ threatens him with the police and Spud dumps in his nappy. Why does it look like AJ lives in a trap house? I guess TNA really weren't paying him enough. And it's not exactly badass, is it? Threatening to go and call the police. This is not good. With AJ still absent, Dixie Carter crowned a new champion with Magnus capturing the belt in the Dixieland match. AJ Styles returned straight away and he wasn't happy about the new paper champion. He told Magnus he didn't think he was a real champion until he'd beaten Styles. AJ wanted a title unification match, but Magnus was scared and took some convincing. It would have been much cooler if this could have dragged out long with AJ popping back into TNA a few weeks later to challenge him again and Magnus putting it off, or something else getting in the way. But instead, no, let's do it straight away as soon as Magnus wins the belt. Missed opportunity right there. Mind you, I don't know if this was in TNA's control with the AJ Styles contract situation. There was still some time for another stupid AJ Styles shoot promo on TNA Dixie. He agrees to sign a one-night deal to settle it all. 
A bad moment from Styles now as he agrees that the match tonight will be a no DQ match. I absolutely hate this when baby faces do things that make them look stupid. He says he's got plenty of friends in the back who'll help him, so he isn't worried. Throughout that night, the Hills then proceed to kill any baby faces that could potentially be friends of AJ Styles. I love how whenever major storylines are happening, the cruiserweights and women are pretty much just not considered to be part of the main storyline. Anyway, you all know what happens next, one of the most horrible TNA matches of all time. Not because it was poorly wrestled, but because it was booked like a pile of bird turd and made Magnus look like a complete joke and he'd never really recover from this match, in TNA at least. We've got Rockstar Spurred and Young EC3 interfering. Sting saves Styles from them. Now the fucking bromance are here. These three idiots beat up Sting and AJ. Styles refuses to give up and he kicks out of almost everything that happens, with only the slowness of Earl Hebner's count really giving him a chance. Now bad influence are here. Earl Hebner eventually walks out of the match and he's replaced by his son. Sting and AJ deal with bad influence and DJZ. In this match, AJ hits the grand total of one Styles clash to Magnus, and Magnus hits a grand total of nothing to Styles. Bobby Roode hits the Roode Bomb three times and Magnus finally wins the match. He spent the whole match in the corner watching everyone else do moves. An absolutely disgusting match with eight people interfering. Nine if you count Sting. There were some decent matches in this no one gimmick, but this last match was completely horrible. And I mean, I don't really want to get into this territory, but could AJ have not had a word backstage and asked to not be booked quite so strongly? And that's actually it. AJ Styles done with TNA. He'd never appear there again. Well, at least until a couple of weeks ago in a pre-recorded segment for Slammiversary. Now we need to decide if this thing was good or not. I have to say, I don't think it connected with the audience, which is why halfway through they toned down his tweener side and he became a full-blown face again for absolutely no reason. It was always going to be a tough pill to swallow, especially when you took away a lot of why he was popular in the first place. I think it was an intriguing story at first. It was something completely new for him and he did need something new to do. But he didn't really have any mic time to establish his new character. He was essentially a mute for three months. By the time he started talking again, he went back to being a good guy almost straight away. This whole storyline also meant lots and lots of mic time for Hill Dixie Carter, so I'm going to say AJ's guilty by association for this. I remember sort of enjoying this at the time, but I always wish they pushed it further. It was a bit like when CM Punk took the title and went home, but they pushed it slightly further than that. I just wish they'd gone all the way. Have Styles beating up literally everyone. Delve a bit deep into the storyline at the start where they were saying that AJ was leaving his family and getting into trouble. Where was he going all that time he'd been missing? That was never explained. Claire Lynch? Have him defend the belt in more than two places. And have him only drop it when everything is ready instead of a week after Magnus won the Dixieland match. Let Magnus get a couple of wins so their unification match feels like more of a big deal. So I'm going to put it in the no, it blows category. If you strip away his cool music and the fact he was finally doing something different and that he's AJ Styles, what were you really left with? A bunch of bad shoot promos that the audience sounded bored through. A bad haircut. AJ Styles, no one. Was it any good? No, it was not. And if you don't agree with that, I'll make your girl squat.